Hey, it's Tim back for Wrong Sports. And last video, I talked about the best underrated teams of the 1920s, or maybe least talked about teams of the 1920s. I'm going to be continuing that with the least talked about best teams of the 1930s, or maybe best underrated teams of the 1930s. And I'm not going to be going over like just seasons. A few of these teams, I'm going to be covering two or maybe three year runs. So just a heads up on that. As always, though, I'm going to be going in chronological order but first make sure you like this video make sure you share this video subscribe to the channel please and also make sure you leave me a comment just tell me what you like about the video what you don't like about the video what teams I should be covering what topics I should be going over and as always make sure you find me on Twitter at sports wronged and follow me there as we start the list but let's start out the decade with a three-year run of a team. This is the 1933 through 1935 Princeton Tigers. And the reason why I'm doing this three-year stretch like I explained about a minute ago is because the Tigers were 25-1 and with their only loss coming on a 7 to nothing crushing defeat by Yale in 1934. But let's start with 1933. They started this run under Fritz Chrysler, who you might know from his Michigan days. He was also an end at Chicago under Amos Alonzo Stagg in the 1920s and built up Minnesota before coming to Princeton just the year before. He started out in 1932 with a 2-2-3 two, two, and three record, but in 1933 everything was working out for them as they went 9-0. and oh, They beat Navy, Rutgers, Columbia, and Yale all while outscoring them 217 to eight. And yeah, they had seven shutouts this season. They only gave up a touchdown in their second to last game versus Rutgers. And then they gave up a safety in their final game versus Yale. Then they started out the 1934 season with a 6-0 record before that crushing loss to Yale, but 1935 would be their most talented season, and I say this because they had a first pick All-American guard in Jack Weller. And then they had five other players along with Weller that made the AP All-East team. With all of that talent, especially on their O-line and D-line, they continued not giving up any points, as they never gave up more than a touchdown. In 1935, they played all Eastern opponents again, but with more future Ivy teams teams like Penn, who they started the season with just barely beating them by one point. They then proceeded to dominate after that by shutting out Harvard, Navy, and Cornell. And then after that, they finished the season facing 8-0 Dartmouth, and then they beat them by 20 before giving 6-2 Yale their worst loss of the season, 38-7. During this three-year run, Princeton never gave up more than a touchdown, plus they have 15 shutouts out of 26 games. Their 1933 season may have been more dominant than their 1935 season, but they were definitely more talented in their 1935 season. So here is another team that I'm going to mention that you might not know about, but they were a great team with a great coach and a great player. The team is Western Reserve, which is a school just outside of Cleveland, and in 1960 they merged with Case to be Case Western Reserve. And back in the 1930s, this team was basically an Ivy League school in Ohio. They were coached by Bill Everts, who is a coaching legend throughout Ohio, as he would win some Division III titles with Wittenberg in the 1960s, but he got started in the 1930s with Western Reserve. And Western Reserve were really good before Edwards came in, as they were 7-1-1 the year before he came in, plus they had star player Ray Za. Za was a starter on the 1934 team, which was tearing through their schedule before a mid-season date with Ohio State, who shut them out and beat them pretty bad. But that loss only fueled them for their next few seasons, as in 1935 they went 9-0-1, with their only tie being at Ohio Wesleyan. Otherwise, in 1935 they beat all of their other mid-level Ohio schools, as well as beat Cornell. Along with this unbeaten record, Zod led the nation scoring with 112 points, and I don't have all of his game stats unfortunately, but with 112 points and probably kicking some extra points, he had at least 15 touchdowns. Case under Za and Edwards would go completely undefeated in 1936 as they went 10 and 0. And though Za didn't have the scoring record, he still led them through their three-year stretch going 26-1-2. And, and along with scoring a lot, their defense also stepped up with a total of 15 shutouts, 5 in 1935, and 6 in 1936. Edwards would go on to coach until the 1970s, and he is currently a college football Hall of Famer. 
And up next is a team that I really didn't know about, but then I heard about a really cool stat that they're one of the only Western teams to win back-to-back -back Sugar Bowls, so then I had to start looking them up. This is the 1936 and 1937 Santa Clara Broncos. Both of these teams were coached by Buckshaw, who was a coach at NC State and Nevada before moving to Santa Clara to be a line coach and then taking over the head coaching role just before the 1936 season. Shaw was a player on the early teams of Newt Rockney at Notre Dame, and he added some of that to Santa Clara. They started the 1936 season with a hell of an offensive line, starred by Dick Bassey, who was an All-American pick by numerous outlets and also played several years professionally, and behind him was quarterback Nello Felicezzi, who was also a first-team pick All-PCC. Behind those two on offense, they didn't score a lot of points, but they got the job done because their defense was so awesome. They had three shutouts this season, and they rarely, if ever, gave up points. They started the 1936 season winning their first four games all against Western opponents, then they got to play a Southern power in Auburn at home. Auburn were ranked and unbeaten at 4-0-1, and they only gave up 13 points in those five games. Santa Clara only needed 12 points though, as they had shut out Auburn and scored a huge win for their program. Because of the Auburn win, Santa Clara scored their first top 10 ranking in the AP poll, which just started a few years ago. They would have no problem in their next few games, but at 7-0, the Broncos would play another team that was just getting a ton of credit for being really good in TCU, who were led this season by the legendary quarterback Sammy Baugh. TCU were 7-2-2, they were scoring tons of points, and they were looking for a top 10 win. But Santa Clara fought, and they fought hard, and they didn't let Sammy Baugh go crazy in this game, as they only scored 9 points, but the Broncos couldn't score anything as they lost. But even with this loss, Santa Clara was invited to play the SEC champion and undefeated LSU in the Sugar Bowl. LSU were pretty much the home team as they were playing this game in their home state, but that didn't matter to the Santa Clara, who took it to them early, coming out with a 14-0 lead after the first quarter. But this game was more known for the sloppiness, as there was lots of rain resulting in 16 total turnovers and helping Santa Clara win this game 21-14. Santa Clara ended the season 8-1. They beat number two LSU in that final game, giving them a final ranking of number three. The next season, Coach Shaw was looking to repeat the success of 1936, but they would lose their QB and improve their offensive line though, as Albert Wolf and Phil Daughtry would step up to All-American status. They started the 1937 season for Stanford, who were PCC champions and went to the Rose Bowl from 1933 to 1935. They did have a losing season in 1936, but they were still a Western power. Santa Clara took the lead eventually and then held off Stanford to win 14-7. They then proceeded to shut out their next four opponents, including San Francisco, and they were now ranked in the top 10 with a 5-0 record, but would see their streak of not giving up any points end as they would beat San Jose in their sixth game, 25-2, but then they would shut out their final two opponents, making them 8-0 and ranked number 9, and get another invitation to the Sugar Bowl with a rematch against LSU. And unfortunately, LSU were coming into this game with one loss unlike last year, but like last year, LSU was very heavily favored to win this game. And this game went a lot like last year too, in that Santa Clara scored in the first quarter and then just stopped LSU all game, barely winning 6 to nothing. I say barely because LSU had few turnovers, double the amount of yards, and first downs, but Santa Clara were saved when Wolf stopped LSU's best drive at the three-yard line. Santa Clara would win the Sugar Bowl again and culminate this two-year run with a 17-1 record, winning games by an average of 17 to 2.5. They had the best scoring defense in the NCAA in 1937, and that's a big mention because 1937 was a huge season with lots of really good teams, and I'll be mentioning another team from that season up next. But Santa Clara had almost 10 All-Americans named to list during these two seasons. Unfortunately though, Santa Clara would drop football during wartime in 1942, and Shaw went on to become the first official coach of the Air Force team in 1956. 
Okay, and I told you 1937 was a really great season, and it was. Here is one of the really good teams. This is the 1937 Fordham Rams. This team had a great coach in Jim Crowley. He was famous because he played on the 1924 Notre Dame team, and he was one of the four horsemen. Crowley became coach of Fordham in 1933 after a stint at Michigan State, and he had winning records every year at Fordham. Their last two years were his best as they went 6-1-2 in 1935 and then 5-1-2 in 1936 and being nationally ranked in both years. Also, over the last two seasons, Crowley and his assistant coach, future Notre Dame and national title winning coach Frank Leahy, built the seven blocks of granite as they were called which was their offensive and defensive lines as they were the best in the country as they gave up less than a touchdown in every game but one over these two seasons. And they had eight shutouts in 1935 and 1936 total. Also, one of the most famous players on their line from 1935 to 1936 was the famous Vince Lombardi. But even though this team got to great heights, they were stopped by Purdue in 1935, and then they had a crushing loss in their final game to NYC rival NYU, which unfortunately spoiled their chances at a bowl game that season too. But when the 1937 season started, they were looking to have no mistakes, and even though Lombardi would graduate, they still had two college football Hall of Famers and All-Americans this year on their line in Ed Franco and Alex Wojohovitz. The blocks of granite showed their dominance in their first two games with shutouts and scoring 114 points. But these two games got them ready for their next game against Pittsburgh. The pick game was really significant because over the last two seasons, they played to 0-0 ties at Pitt. And also, Pitt were coming into this game unbeaten and also help one of them potentially get to a bowl game at the end of the season. The game was played in NYC at the Polo Grounds in front of 53,000 people, and it would be fought hard just like the last two, but unfortunately, it ended in a 0-0 tie. With the tie, Fordham were now 2-0-1, and they were ranked in the first rankings of the year at number 9 but Pitt were ranked a little higher for some weird reason. Fordham got the defending Southwest Conference champions next in TCU and Davey O'Brien. Fordham held off O'Brien and managed to score a touchdown and kick an extra point so that they could win 7-6 to continue their winning ways. Now they were ranked in the top 10, and they traveled to Chapel Hill to play the number 15 ranked UNC, who were 4-0-1, and, and they also had a win over Fordham's rival NYU. The blocks of granite stood up as they shut out the Tar Heels 14 0, and then they came back to New York City to finish their season. They would first play Fordham and beat them 21 3, then they shut out St. Mary's before their NYC rivalry game against NYU. NYU were 5 3 and looking to ruin Fordham's season again, but the blocks of granite prevailed and Fordham completed their unbeaten season 7 0 1. Fordham wasn't invited to a bowl game this season, and because Pittsburgh finished unbeaten, they were ranked number one and they won the AP national title over Fordham. Fordham this season scored 182 points or 22 points per game. Meanwhile, they stopped every one as they had five shutouts and only gave up 16 points. Fordham under Crowley continued to be really good as he coached them until 1942 and they had winning records and they were ranked every year. Plus, they also went to a Sugar Bowl in 1942, his final game. Finally, I'm ending the 1930s, going to New York, and going with another future Ivy League team, but not a usual Ivy League team. I mentioned how Dartmouth was underrated in my previous video, but Cornell was rated a little higher as they had a great run from 1921 to 1923 under Gil Doby as they went undefeated all three years, but Doby left in 1935, meaning Cornell had to bring in someone new, and they found a new coach in Carl Snevely. He previously coached at Bucknell, and he coached Cornell up quickly, as in his second season in 1937, they went 5-2-1, then in his third season in 1938, they went 5-1-1, and they were ranked number 10. Cornell was also like the previous team I mentioned, Fordham, in that they had a great line, but not a cool name for it. This season, though, they would have a unanimous All-American pick in Nick Drejos, and a few others also named to lists. With this line, they started with a home game versus 
Syracuse, who had a winning record the previous year, but Cornell made easy work of them, beating them 19-6. They would then travel to Princeton, who were coming off a few struggling years, but were really good this year, as they ended the season 7-1 with their only loss coming to Cornell in this game, as Cornell beat them 20-7. With this win, Cornell came back home to shut out Penn State, and they were then ranked number seven as they got ready for a top five team versus the Big Ten champion, Ohio State. They traveled to Ohio Stadium and saw 50,000 people waiting to see them as this game went back and forth, but Cornell managed to come away with a 23-14 win and propelling them to number three in the nation. They got a short little rest as their next two games versus Columbia and Colgate were a little easier, but they still had to squeak by with wins of less than six points in each of those games. They then had a tougher test versus Dartmouth next, who were ranked even though they lost the previous week versus Princeton by two. Cornell would wipe the floor with Dartmouth, though, as they beat him by 28 points. Cornell ended their season versus Penn, and Cornell didn't let Penn have anything, as they shut him out 26 to nothing, ending their season 8-0. They were ranked number three, and they were invited to the Rose Bowl, but apparently they wanted to focus on academics, and they declined the trip to Los Angeles, and instead stayed in New York. Because they declined the Rose Bowl, they missed out on their chance to play unbeaten number two USC for a possible chance at a number one ranking and the national title, but this 1939 season was by far Cornell's best season until the 1960s. Well, there you go. They were the best underrated or maybe least talked about teams of the 1930s. As always, make sure you like the video. Make sure you share this video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, please. Also, make sure you find me on Twitter at Sports wronged. Coming up next, I'm going to be doing a whole bunch of deep dives on teams with losing records and teams that you might not know about that had really bad losing streaks. Yeah, I'll go more into that in a couple of weeks, so make sure you just stay tuned for that as always, though. And thank you so much for hanging out with me for Wrong Sports.